Good day everyone, I am Gubili Ramos and welcome to another video lecture. For today's lesson, we will discuss The Passionate Shepherd to His Love by Christopher Marlowe. Disclaimer, all the photos and videos used in this video lecture are used for academic purposes only and belong to the rightful owner. But before we start our discussion proper, let's have an icebreaker. I will read and present a definition of a particular word and I will give you 10 seconds to identify the word we are looking for. Are you ready? Let's get started! Number 1. A feeling of happy satisfaction and enjoyment. Your 10 seconds starts now. Times. The correct answer is pleasure. Number two, producing or having a pleasant tune. Your 10 seconds starts now. Time's up. The correct answer is melodious. Number three, a woman's gown or outer petticoat. Your 10 seconds starts now. Time's up. The correct answer is curtail. Number four, a person who tends and rears sheep. Your 10 seconds starts now. Time's up. The correct answer is shepherd. And number five, an evergreen shrub which has glossy aromatic foliage and white flowers followed by purple black oval berries. Your 10 seconds starts now. Time's up. The correct answer is myrtle. All the words you just identify is related to our lesson and you will encounter them to the literary piece we will discuss. For our objectives, at the end of the lesson, the students should be able to First, identify the themes in literary pieces to be discussed. Second, Explain how an author develops the point of view of the narrator or speaker in a text. And lastly, develop a response to Marlowe's poem. Let us first discuss the author of the literary piece, The Passionate Shepherd to His Love. The author of The Passionate Shepherd to His Love is none other than Christopher Marlowe. He was born on February 6, 1564, an Elizabethan poet and William Shakespeare's most important predecessor in English drama. He is noted specially for his establishment of dramatic blank verse. In a playwriting career that spanned little more than six years, Marlowe's achievements were diverse and splendid. He is known as the father of English tragedy, and he died on May 30, 1593. Let us now move forward to discuss the background of the passionate shepherd to his love. The passionate shepherd to his love is a pastoral poem 
meaning it is set in an idealized version of the countryside, where life is good and the air is sweet. Plot-wise, the poem basically comes down one lover saying to another lover, Move to the country with me and once you're there, we can play by the river. Listen to the birds sing and I'll even make you some bohemian chick clothing to boot. The poem was first published or at least part of it was in 1599 in a hodgepodge poetry collection called The Passionate Pilgrim. But people who have spent decades in libraries studying Marlowe think that it was likely written in the mid to late 1580s, a few years before his death. This places the composition of the poem somewhere near the beginning of Marlowe's career and definitely before he became a big shot in the Renaissance theater world. Now, Marlowe wasn't exactly people's first choice for moral compass of the century. He was busted counterfeiting money. He was convicted for crimes worthy of execution several times, but somehow mysteriously never went to trial. He talked trash about God and the Anglican Church, and he was a drunk with a bad temper. The apparent simplicity and innocence of the passionate shepherd seems to contradict this image of a vice-ridden Marlowe, but the lyric actually packs a lot of punch once you look at it a little deeper. Gender issues, social criticism, classical allusions, sexuality, and manipulation are all in there too, just waiting to be unearthed. Let us now watch and listen to the video presentation taken from YouTube, The Passionate Shepherd to His Love. Come live with me and be my love And we will all the pleasures prove That valleys, groves, hills and fields Woods or steepy mountain yields And we will sit upon the rocks Seeing the shepherds feed their flocks By shallow rivers to whose falls Melodious birds sing madrigals and I will make thee beds of roses and a thousand fragrant posies, a cap of flowers and a kirtle embroidered all with leaves of myrtle. A gown made of the finest wool which from our pretty lambs we pull. Fair lined slippers for the cold with buckles of the purest gold, a belt of straw and ivy buds, with coral clasps and amber studs. And if these pleasures may thee move, come live with me and be my love. The shepherd's swains shall dance and sing for thy delight each May morning. If these delights thy mind may move, then live with me and be my love.
now that we are done watching the video presentation, let us analyze the stanzas 1 and 2. For lines 1 and 2, Come live with me and be my love, and we will all the pleasures probe. This poem opens with one of the most famous and romantic sounding lines ever. Come live with me and be my love. The format of the opening line sets up the two main figures in the poem. The speaker, the one saying, come live with me, and the person being spoken to or the addressee. So far, we have very little about confirming the logistics of this move. However, who is the addressee? Who is the speaker? Are they lovers now? Or is the speaker's love unrequited? Is this a marriage proposal? Where are they moving? Do they both already live there? Or is the speaker asking the addressee to pack up house and move halfway across the country? The title would have you believe that the speaker is a man, a passionate shepherd, and that his love is presumably a woman. Since Marlowe wasn't the one who gave the poem its title, though we're going to hold off on making any judgments until the text of the poem confirms the shepherd business. Now on to line 2. First, let's take care of the wording to probe. As Renaissance speak for experience. So the line is saying that if the speaker's love will come, the two of them can experience the pleasures of their new home together. The word and is small, but very important. It attaches the second line to the request in line 1 and means that those pleasures will be experienced if the addressee does in fact decide to shock up with the speaker. But if the addressee doesn't accept the speaker's request, all deals are off the table, at least as far as we can tell. Let us now jump to lines 3 and 4. Dot valleys, groves, hills, and fields, woods, or steepy mountain yields. Valleys, groves, hills, and fields, woods, steepy mountains, now we're getting somewhere as far as establishing a location goes. We now know that the pleasures referenced in line 2 are the pleasures of the outdoors, more specifically the countryside. Notice how the list sort of runs from one line to another. That friends is enjambment. Which means that one sentence, phrase, or clause is split between two lines of verse. Here, running the two lines together draws attention to the number of different places the countryside offers to explore in an effort to make the scenery all the more appealing to this lady love. And now that we've got four lines under our collective belt, we've got to be looking for a meter. It just so happens that this little ditty is written in iambic tetrameter, which we will discuss more later. Do you hear that the doom, the doom, the doom, the doom in each of the lines? That's the meter at work. But line 3 marks an important deviation from what's otherwise a pretty cut and dried pattern. If you scan the line, you get something like this. That valleys, groves, hills, and fields. See how there's a missing and stress syllable between groves and hills? 
that makes the line sound a little heavy which echoes the effect of the enjambment and draws even more attention to the number of places listed by the speaker. Just like continuing one line to another forces the reader to hurry along to the next beat. The heaviness of line 3 adds to its forward momentum sort of like a rock rolling down a hill. Line 4 marks the end of the first quatrain. In fact, the whole poem is composed of six total quatrains, just like the one above, all of which follow the rhyme scheme. And what rhyme scheme is that, you ask? Well, love rhymes with probe, or at least it does in Marlowe speak, and filled rhymes with yield. That means we've got a good old-fashioned A-A-B-B. Let us now move forward to lines 5 and 6. And we will sit upon the rocks, seeing the shepherds feed their flocks. In line 5 and 6, we find yet another promise from the speaker. The plan is pretty self-explanatory. They will sit on rocks watching shepherds feed their sheep. While that might not sound romantic to us modern-day folks, we're guessing that back then, sitting around watching sheep was a lot like a candlelight dinner or something. Also, the plans the speaker details here don't put forth the most aggressive agenda. Sitting on rocks, watching sheep eat, these are not activities that require a lot of energy. In fact, they sound downright leisurely, given the realities of country life in the 16th century. No Walmarts, no electricity, self-sustaining farms, etc. Does this lifestyle sound a little too good to be true? Maybe yes, maybe no. But hold on to that thought, we'll come back to it soon. These two lines exhibit a poetic device that pops up in Marlowe's poetry all the time, which is alliteration. It is the repetition of usually initial consonant sound in two or more neighboring words or syllables. Hear that S sound in seeing the shepherds or the F sound in feed their flocks. That beer is alliteration and Marlowe's a big fan so keep an ear out for more. For line 7 and 8, by shallow rivers to whose falls melodious birds sing madrigals. Line 7 tells us that the shepherds from line 6 are feeding their sheep somewhere near shallow rivers. And line 8 adds to this already scenic picture. Birds are singing songs or madrigals to the beat of some nearby waterfalls. We don't know about you, but we're relaxed just thinking about this. But the bird singing in tune to the waterfalls is something more likely to be found in a Disney movie than in the actual English countryside. Lovely though it may be. This is because the passionate shepherd to his love is what we call a pastoral poem, which means that it glorifies the simple, rustic pleasures of the countryside and of country life. These two lines introduce another poetic device called consonance which is pretty much exactly like alliteration, except the consonant sounds don't have to be at the beginning of the word. The repeated L sound in shallow, false, melodious, and madrigals is consonants, whereas the repeated M sound in melodious and madrigals is alliteration. We're betting Marlowe's pulling all these tricks on purpose, but what exactly do we think the guy's trying to accomplish? 
Some people might argue that his use of poetic devices is an attempt to disguise the lack of meat in the speaker's offer and somehow make it more appealing. Others think the sounds are recreating the soothing sounds of the countryside. Let us now move forward to discuss stanzas 3 and 4. For lines 9 and 10, And I will make the beds of roses and a thousand fragrant posies. Now the speaker is talking about making things. Beds of flowers in this case. Wait a second. Beds of flowers? Flower beds? Do we smell a pond in the oven? But wait, there's more. Marlowe is also making a pun on the phrase, A Thousand Fragrant Posies. Posy is a Renaissance-era word for bunches of flowers, but in Marlowe's day, it was also another name for poetry, or posies. This double meaning allows line 10 to be read in several ways. The speaker is planting flower beds, the speaker is making beds out of roses and bunches of flowers. The speaker is making beds out of roses and poetry. Or the speaker is making beds of roses and is also composing thousands of fragrant poems. If you ever use the phrase, no bed of roses to describe a particularly nasty homework assignment, congratulations! You are quoting Marlowe. In the poem, Marlowe seems to be referring to an actual bed made of rose petals, but bed of roses as an expression has come to mean something more like a super luxurious or easy situation. Let us now move forward to discuss lines 11 and 12. A cap of flowers and a kirtle, embroidered all with leaves of myrtle. These lines reveal more promises from the speaker. We're starting to see a trend. The speaker is clearly going to lots of trouble to promise nice things in an effort to persuade the addressee to accept the whole Come live with me and be my love offer. Why are so many promises necessary? You didn't hear it from us, but it sounds like someone might be afraid of getting rejected. Our speaker is quite the sewing machine now promising to make cups or hats of flowers and a kirtle or skirt that is embroidered with myrtle leaves, the earthy floral material being used to make the cloths is in keeping with pastoral theme that was established in the previous quatrain. We're also picking up some potential Garden of Eden vibes what with the trees for cloths talk going on. And now, let's jump to lines 13 and 14. A gown made of the finest wool which from our pretty lambs we pull. Our speaker is still going on about cloths. Now, he's making a gown from lamb's wool and not just any lamb's wool, the finest and best lamb's wool. Freshly plucked from all those lambs leaving the dream up by the river with the waterfalls in Instanza 2. Clothes are everywhere in this stanza, and it's not because our speaker has gone on a shopping spree. Instead, Marlowe has now started playing around with a poetic device called blazon. Blazons are a kind of poetry in which the speaker of the poem praises another person, usually a woman by singling out different parts of her body and using metaphors to describe how beautiful and awesome they are. 
Of course, this isn't a typical one since we don't know anything at all about whom he's speaking to. But it fits the general mode. For a famous and more traditional example, check out Shakespeare's Sonnet 130. Let us now move forward to lines 15 and 16. Fair line sleepers for the cold with buckles of the purest gold. In lines 15 and 16, our speaker is still in blazon mode. We have fuzzy sleepers to keep toes warm and toasty in the winter, complete with snazzy gold buckles. Here, the idealism of the pastoral really starts to get away from our speaker. Sure, it's feasible that a shepherd could make wool gowns, warm shoes, and hats of flowers, but buckles of gold? Those don't exactly pop up at random in the countryside. And frankly, they sound really impractical for a pair of slippers. Let us now discuss stanzas 5 to 6. For line 17 and 18, a belt of straw and ivy buds with coral clasp and umber studs. Our speaker is really blazoning a trail here. We're also moving increasingly farther away from promises the speaker can legitimately keep. Coral and umber were costly products in Marlowe's time. They certainly weren't up for grabs in the countryside and were willing to bet that they were out of the price range of most shepherds. And for lines 19 and 20, And if these pleasures may be move, come live with me and be my love. Line 19 tells the speaker's love that if the awesome things described in the poem so far move, or win you over, then you should follow the instructions in line 20 and hightail it to the countryside. The use of the word pleasures here adds a sexual charge to the stanza. Could the speaker's intention to be more lust and less love-oriented than we were led to believe? It also a callback to the first stanza of the poem. Reminding us that at its heart, this poem is an argument. He's attempting to persuade his audience the object of his affections and he'll use a refrain to do it. The word move implies a feeling fueled by emotions or gut instincts. This gives us a heads up as to what tactics the speaker is using to persuade the recipient of the poem to do what he wants. The if in line 19 also alters the come live with me request from the form in which we first encounter it back in line 1. The if makes it conditional which tells us that the speaker now wants the person to come if and only if the aforementioned fun times are appealing to them. That's an interesting way to praise it since it seems less and less likely those pleasures are within the speaker's ability to provide. And now for lines 21 and 22, the shepherd swain shall dance and sing, for tie the light each May morning. We've arrived. This, folks, is the speaker's final promise, and true to form, it's even more difficult to ensure than the last. Lines 21 and 22 promise that shepherd swains or young men will dance and sing for the beloved's delight every morning in the month of May. Unlike the expensive clothes, which at least the speaker was trying to make, this is something completely beyond the speaker's control. How can the speaker guarantee what other people will do for his beloved? 
Now let's discuss this whole shepherd business. If you've got shepherds in a poem, you'll probably have a pastoral. But if you got shepherds in a poem from Elizabethan England, you also have a potential reference to good old Queen Bess herself. This is thanks to a guy named Edmund Spencer who wrote a collection of poems called The Shepherd's Calendar in which he compared Queen Elizabeth to a shepherdess. This might seem offensive, but back in the day, you weren't exactly allowed to come out and speak your mind about politics. Allegory and symbolism were ways in which people could express discontent without getting their heads chopped off. For lines 23 and 24, if this delights thy mind may move, then live with me and be my love. These lines seem pretty similar to lines 19 and 20, but there are some important differences in the wording. First, the speaker is talking about the lights instead of pleasures, a switch that reduces the sexual charge of the statement. The speaker has also introduced the mind into the picture. The word move is still used, but here it is the address's mind that is being swayed, not by contrast, her body or emotions. The live with me and be my love praise is repeated three times in this poem which is a big heads up that it's probably important. It's possible that this guy wants to do more than just shock up. Maybe if he's interested in his love's mind as much as he's interested in her body and all the fancy clothes he's going to put on it, he might want, you know, a life with her. In which case, this poem is quite sunny. What's up with the title? At first glance, not much. The passionate shepherd to his love seems to be a pretty bland and an imaginative description of what goes on in the poem, particularly when you contrast the straightforwardness of the title to the poetic beauty of Marlowe's lyric. But... The contrast brings up an important point Marlowe didn't name the poem. And while it's tempting to think that this makes the title less important, the Renaissance editor that slapped on the poem's conventional title has drastically influenced the way it is read. The rather boring title names the passionate shepherd as the speaker of the poem the mention of the shepherd alerts readers from the get-go that this poem is going to be heavy on fluffy sheep, fields of flowers, bubbling brooks, and other tropes of pastoral poetry. The title also firms up the addressee of the poem, The Shepherd's Love. So now the readers also know that country's boys got a crush and that he's hoping this poem will work some magic for his cause. But these are all things that you can get from reading the poem, right? The answer is wrong. We've been occasionally referring to the speaker as a he for clarity's sake, but if you look again, you'll notice there are no hims, hers, she's, his or any other gender defining vocabulary words anywhere in the poem. The conventional title is actually the only thing that explicitly designates the poem speaker as male. If this seems surprising to you, then Marlowe has done his job well. Writing gender ambiguity was considered a great skill in the Renaissance and Marlowe's ability to write a poem that seems like it conforms to gender expectations without 
actually confirming them was thought to be pretty impressive stuff. Now, let us move forward to discuss the settings. We've said it before and we'll say it again. The passionate shepherd to his love is a poem set in the countryside, and not just an old countryside at that. This poem is a pastoral poem, which means the version of the countryside it depicts is a little bit too good to be true in real life. The passionate shepherd also focuses in on the countryside in springtime. Because if you're already planning on eliminating all the unpleasant aspects of living in the country, why not just go ahead and present it in its best and prettiest time of year too? Never mind that winter will come and kill off all those flowers and the baby lambs that are so cute now will eventually be turned into some sort of stew. But the springtime setting serves a double purpose. All the references to budding flowers, baby animals, and the month of May not only set the scene. They also emphasize the new life and fertility associated with the springtime. Which is not a bad thing to mention if you're trying to convince someone it's a good idea to take you as a lover and to move in with you. Let us now discuss the speaker in the literary piece. The title tells us the speaker is a passionate shepherd trying to woo his lover, presumably a woman to live with him in the countryside, but Marlowe didn't title the poem. So even though this could be a valid reading, we can't just assume that's the only way to go. In fact, literary critics will tell you that the speaker could just as likely be a woman and write hundreds of pages about how this drastically alters the meaning of the poem. But we're not in the business of writing hundreds of pages of literary criticism. Let's start with what we do know. The speaker has obviously got some thoughts, plans, and opinions. He or she wants someone to move in with them and wants to be more than friends. The large number of promises and persuasive arguments that follow the initial Come, live with me, and be my love. However, indicate that the speaker thinks this other person might take some convincing before the offer is accepted. This seems reasonable, given the fact that this guy seems more than a little impulsive. Come, live with me sounds very romantic, but it also doesn't sound particularly well thought out. Notice that the come live with me request doesn't include an offer of marriage or any promise of an enduring relationship. In fact, the speaker's arguments all appeal to sensations and feelings as opposed to logical reasoning. The use of the word passionate in the title might not be Marlowe's, but it's a spot of description of the way the speaker seems to be making decisions based on emotions and passions as opposed to reasoning. We mean, are these two even gonna have a roof over their heads? Perhaps? The most important thing we know about the speaker, however, is that he or she is trying to enter into a dialogue with someone else who is keeping her mouth shut big time. The poem demands a response and yet Marlowe holds out on us. This raises interesting questions. What would the response be? How might it change depending on who you think the speaker of the poem is, but also points to another crucial issue, which is the speaker's trustworthiness.
Just how reliable do we think the speaker is? Do we believe what he or she is saying? Are we moving to the country in spite of our better judgment? Because those ships sound just too darn fluffy to resist? This isn't a question Marlowe answers for us, but it's one that several other authors have found irresistible. Check out some famous replies by Sir Walter Raleigh, John Donne, Robert Herrick, and Ogden Nash. Let us move forward to discuss form and meter. If the passionate shepherd to his love was one of the earlier poems you read in school, we're betting your teacher chose it because it's a great example of regular rhyme and meter. In this case, Marlowe writes in iambic tetrameter, which means he's got four iams per line, making each line go the doom, the doom, the doom, the doom, and he's got a pretty basic rhyme scheme. A, A, B. Check this out. And we will sit upon the rocks, seeing the shepherds feed their flocks. By shallow rivers to whose falls, melodious birds sing madrigals. With the exception of line 6, which starts off with a trochet, seeing goes the doom instead of the doom, this is pretty darn perfect iambic tetrameter. So perfect, in fact, it sounds more like a song than a poem. The entire poem is composed of six four-line stanzas or quatrains, just like the one above. Each quatrain is made up of two rhyming couplets, the majority of which are written in perfect iambic tetrameter. And if you use Renaissance-era pronunciation, rhyme perfectly. Sure, most verses in tetrameter end up sounding a little sing-songy when read aloud, but Marlowe avoids this effect by peppering his lines with poetic devices that sneakily shake things up and steer clear of the nursery rhyme curse. Take a look at this couplet from the third stanza. And I will make thee beds of roses and a thousand fragrant posies. A perfect line of iambic tetrameter should end in a stressed syllable. But in line 9, Marlowe forces an extra unstressed syllable onto the end of the line, the S-E-S of roses. You might think this would mock up the meter, but if you read line aloud, the extra syllable adds a little pieces to the line without making it feel awkward or jarring. Marlowe's substitution of a trochet, the doom, for an I am in line 10 works in a similar way. The changes create variety and texture within the meter. So the poem avoids sounding like little boo peep, but still colors within the lines too. He creates a metrical musicality that mirrors the springness of the countryside in which the speaker wants his lover to live. Anytime you're dealing with a pastoral, it's safe to assume there's going to be lots of nature imagery in the mix. We're talking frolicking lambs, rolling hills, bubbling brooks, and cows that magically never poop. It's all drop-dead gorgeous, and it's all too good to be true. Marlowe chooses nature's idealized form for the passionate shepherd to his love, because nature is meant to be seductive. The speaker is hoping the beauty of nature will convince the beloved to move to the countryside, which is why Marlowe sneaks all of the natural imagery into the promises or arguments of the poem. In line 3 and 4, the speaker promises all the pleasures of valleys, groves, hills, and fields, woods, 
steepy mountains that's a lot of different kinds of scenery which the speaker hopes translate into a lot of different ways to enjoy oneself. While in line 5 to 8, And we will sit upon the rock, seeing the shepherds feed their flocks, by shallow rivers to whose falls melodious birds sing madrigals. Not only is nature beautiful, it is also relaxing, peaceful, and safe. The image here of the two lovers sitting on rocks by a river, watching sheep graze in the fields nearby to the tune of birds singing is designed to be both beautiful and soothing. In line 9 to 12, the floral imagery referenced in this stanza, roses, posies, flowers, and myrtle leaves, suggest that this countryside is blooming, fruitful, and fertile. Fertility and prosperity were primary concerns for both women and men in Marlowe's day, and definitely good things to have in your pocket if you're trying to woo someone to come live with you. For line 14, the reference to the lambs in line 14 shows how in this idealized version of the natural world, the countryside provides everything you could need, similar to the way the Garden of Eden is described in the Hebrew Bible. Need cloth? Never fear. All the wool in the world is just a hand stretch away. The spring has sprung, or you know, maybe not. But if you've been reading The Passionate Shepherd to His Love, you probably got the twitter of birds, the smell of flowers, and green hills aplenty all rolling around inside your head. Because of all the computer lingo we use these days, it's easy to forget that a poetic image, unlike a digital image, doesn't have to be purely visual. Sensory imagery or imagery that appeals to senses like smell, taste, touch, and hearing is all over the place in Marlowe's poem, and his decision to take his poetic imagery beyond the visual help bring the idealized countryside to life for his readers. In line 5, sitting on the rocks isn't the most exciting of sensory experiences, but the subtly is part of what makes the imagery so clever. Everyone knows what it feels like to sit on a rock, and reading that line adds a tactile dimension to the poem. It sparks a concept rock sitting in your brain that adds texture to the mental image conjured by the poem without being so foreign or complicated that it distracts from what the poet is saying. In line 6, see the shepherds, watch the sheep, let your eyes soak in the quantities and beauty of everyday life all around you. This is a visual image, a standard but effective. For line 8, we're now sitting on rocks, watching sheep and listening to birds sing in harmony to the sound of a nearby waterfall, all at the same time. The sensory experiences in lines 5 to 8 combine with each other to create a picture of bliss, comfort, and relaxation. By simultaneously ending the stanza and the description of the image with line 8, Marlowe leaves his readers with a multi-sensory image in their minds. For lines 9 and 10, lines 9 and 10 brings in the fragrant smell of flowers and the softness and sensuality of rose petals. For lines 19 to 23, the use of the word move at the end of both these lines underscores the stimulating sensory atmosphere of the poem. 
being moved by pleasures and delights implies an emotional and physical response as opposed to boring old thoughts. The hills are alive with the sound of music, and we have more than just the Von Trapp family to thank for it. Music appears in the Passionate Shepherd literally and rhythmically, and it helps contribute to the light-hearted, lively countryside being portrayed by the speaker. In line 1, Count the consonants that commonly occur and you shall see that some sounds are alliterated abundantly and appear in many more measures than others. As in many other poems, Marlowe makes use of alliteration, consonants, and assonance. In this one, the first instance of this appears in line 1, with the L sound alliterating in live and love. The L sound, among many others, follows the reader through the poem and adds a musicality to the lyrics when read out aloud. In lines 2 and 4, we see more sound play here too. Read the lines aloud to yourself and you'll see what we mean. And we will all the pleasures prove that valleys, groves, hills, and fields, woods, or steepy mountain yields. And for lines 5 to 8, here we're paying more attention to the kinds of sounds Marlowe chooses to repeat rather than the fact that he repeats them. The sounds repeated in the second stanza, the W of we will, the S of seeing the shepherds, the M of melodious and madrigals, and the ever-present L sound are not harsh but light and pretty. By choosing to repeat the sounds as opposed to ones that have a little more bite to them, Marlowe adds to both the musicality of his poetry and the lightness of its tone. For line 21, the image of the shepherd swains dancing and singing is another literal invocation of music. Country festivals often appear in pastoral poetry and are stereotypically associated with lively games, community banding, and obscure country folk traditions, many of which involve music and dancing. Let us now move forward to discuss the themes of the literary piece, The Passionate Shepherd to His Love. First, we have love. What's love got to do with it? And the passionate shepherd to his love, it's hard to tell. The opening line encourages us to think of the poem in terms of romantic interest, but it's not like these two are headed to the marriage altar anytime soon. In fact, we can't even tell if this guy has any intention to drop down on one knee. The poem undoubtedly plays upon romantic ideals, but to what ends? Does the speaker genuinely want love, or does he just want a role in the bed of roses? Here are the questions about love. Number one, do you think the speaker loves the person to whom the poem is addressed? Why or why not? Number two, is there any evidence that the speaker wants a serious romantic relationship in the poem? If yes, does this imply love? If not, what do you see as evidence that he doesn't? And lastly, do poetic devices, as opposed to content, do anything to bolster or debunk love as a theme of this poem? The second theme is the man and the natural world. The passionate shepherd to his love takes place where the grass is always green, nothing ever dies, and nature is complete harmony with all of man's whims, needs, and desires. 
So it's no wonder that the speaker uses nature and all its awesomeness as a convenient way to woo his lady love. Is there anything sexier than sheep? Okay, so there are plenty of things sexier than sheep, but for our speaker, the pastoral world might as well be the most romantic restaurant in town. Here are the questions about man and the natural world. Where does Marlowe shift from describing nature authentically to describing its idealized form? Is this change significant? If so, why? If not, why not? Number two, what specific details and images indicate that this is a pastoral poem? And number three, what role does the speaker's portrayal of nature play in supporting his argument? Does it make his argument more or less convincing to you? Marlowe presents an idealized picture of nature in an attempt to satirize the unrealistic visions of the countryside held by city dwellers. Basically, he is making fun of the folks who think the key to happiness lies in roughing it. Marlowe's choice to portray a pastoral world signifies his dissatisfaction with modern society and urbanization. It is a veiled longing for a return to simpler times. Third, for our themes, we have persuasion. The subtle art of persuasion. In the case of the passionate shepherd to his love, the word art can be taken both literally and figuratively. The speaker of the poem has cleverly and artfully designed what he thinks will be a winning argument, but he has used art or artifice to pull it off in the form of poetry. Here are the questions about persuasion. Number one, the speaker repeats the phrase, Come live with me and be my love, three times in the poem. Do you think this is an effort to be persuasive? Is it desperate? Is it something else? Number two, what does the speaker use of arguments and promises tell us about the address's potential thoughts about shocking up? Number three, do you find the speaker's argument convincing? If yes, why? If not, what should he do to make it a more appealing offer? Number four, is the speaker trustworthy? Why or why not? How can you tell? Does this affect his persuasiveness? How? This dude is totally convincing. He basically promises the object of his affections a long, torturous camping trip complete with really weird outfits and awkward serenades. The speaker of this poem is persuasive but untrustworthy, which means the addressee should run for her life. And lastly, for our team, we have time. The Rolling Stones thought time was on their side, and that seems to be the case for our speaker as well. The speaker in The Passionate Shepherd to His Love is writing what we call a carpe diem poem. He's seizing the day. In literature, the carpe diem tradition usually features a man trying to convince a beautiful maiden to surrender her virginity pronto because she could drop dead at any minute and wouldn't be ashamed for her to die without ever having had sex, especially with him. It's employed a little less obviously in this poem than in others, but the general vibe is, is still there. Come live with me and be my love. We'll have a great time and we'll worry about all that future stuff like your reputation later. Here are the questions about time. Number one, what indications do you see in the poem that the speaker is more concerned with short-term as opposed to long-term plans? Number two, how does the imagery in the poem reflect the carpe diem tradition? And number three, 
why might the Carpe Diem argument be attractive to the person reading this poem? Why might it be unattractive? What, if anything, does the speaker do to make it seem to more attractive than it is? The references to springtime, flowers, and fertility in the poem are symbolic of the fact that the speaker's interest in the address is so temporary. The poem's implementation of the Carpe Diem tradition is a clear indication that Marlowe sees the speaker of this poem as male and the addressee as female. And here is the reference used for this video lecture. That would be the end of our discussion. I hope you learned a lot. Thank you for watching.